Jeff, we were, st we were speaking about listening to people. Um, the closer we get to people's emotions about social network, the more important it is to understand who they are and speak to them in the right way. And you were speaking about data, and we actually use social network as a collect, uh, some, some place to collect data and to understand better who those people are. And we're doing this, for instance, for Warner throughout Twitter, and we try to understand and qualify better who are our customers. And then, for instance, I know that this guy has been watching one of our movie. I know he has a friend on Twitter, and this friend loves comedy, so I will try and push him an advertisement uh, around one of our movie, VOD movie, whatever, uh, around, around uh, comedies. So we try to collect data on Facebook Connect, for instance, and all, in all the major uh, social network. Um, but then the issue is how do we speak to these people because we're speaking about emotion. And we, as uh, people from the advertising, we were used to do crap storytelling. And now we have to get closer from the people who try to tell the right stories. And people who tell the right stories are based actually in LA in Los Angeles. That's why we try and connect with academic universities and studios such as Warner, or Universal, etc. to try and understand how should we tell new kind of stories, emotional stories that could engage with, with people. And it's quite harder because we are led by gurus that know how to tell stories and we have to reconstruct the way we produce all that stuff and we have to get closer to people who know how to speak to people in a more emotional way. And it's a real issue for us. So I, look, I think storytelling is core to social media. You know, being able to share that story, being able to convey it, being able to connect with it, it all goes to some of the, the basic elements of social. But you know, while you guys were talking, I was just realizing that you know, once again, Google is in a very interesting strategic position to, to dominate the world. Because uh, you know, if, if, if it's good to, get a, uh, to purchase a new car a month after you get a new job, imagine a company that's reading all your email robotically See, it knows that I'm talking about I just got a new job a month ago, all of a sudden all the ads I see on the side of my Gmail are all for cars. Or if, uh, if it knows that I broke up with a girlfriend, maybe I see, start seeing ads for, um, for matchmaking services and stuff. I mean, if you start thinking about how intrusive certain things are or not based on what we're saying emotionally, there's a lot that could happen. I still have a theory, by the way, that one day there'll be a movie that someone in here is going to produce that I don't know how many of you, at least in New York, I go, I, I, I walk a lot these days and... Um, so I don't always know how to get from point A to point B, so I'm always going on uh, like Google Maps. So I, I, I believe in serendipity and synchronicity as core elements of life. And so imagine that Google is sort of the global matchmaker. So like, like I, have to, I have an appointment to be someplace at 1 o'clock, so I, I route myself. And, 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 and 20 other people are actually going on routes too, but Google knows. They, they read my email, they saw I broke up with someone, I'm now, I'm now emotionally detached, I need help. And, and, and basically what Google is doing as a matchmaker is creating these serendipitous opportunities where from the corner of your eye on Monday I see somebody and on yes. Wednesday, I happen to be riding someplace else, and that other person happens to be there. By Thursday night, we have coffee. And it's not just me, but it's hundreds of people around the world happening simultaneously because you know, it's understanding your life. It's actually seeing things, and it's feeling things emotionally because you know, if they could get cars to drive without people, they could certainly drive people's lives without us knowing. And so there is this... It's it's a, it, may, it may be scary. Maybe I have an anecdote. For yeah. I, don't know, I don't know if uh, anecdote is an English word, but... This morning I was having breakfast alone and a, a splendid lady came to me and she dropped the newspaper and she said, look at that, it's awful, it's scary. It's a new company that's been uh, built and it can uh, suck all your data every place you are around the world, all the data from all the social network and it gives you a, a profile that can be, sold by, get, can be sold to all the companies. So I read the, the article and I told her, Cool. It's just a book. <laughs> Very nice. Hey, I'd like to go to the audience maybe with just some questions. Uh, Circle. Circle, the name of the book. What is it called? Circle. Circle. So anyone here have questions? Uh, we have a, uh, anyone here have questions for the panel? Don't be too shy. Um, oh, come on. Nobody has a question? This is, uh, we're in Israel, please. Uh, are you, do we confuse you or are you just shy? No one has a question. No one... Ah, stand up please and um, uh, state your name, announce who you are.
Well, obviously, I cannot comment on Google, and I'm not even familiar with what this uh, uh, product is. Uh, but um, every time I speak at conferences, this question comes up, the question of privacy. I, can, I think I can speak on the behalf of most players in the same space by saying that everyone has a really strong priority in respecting members. And the reason for that is the minute you are not worth people's trust, they're going to stop using you. They're going to find alternatives. Everyone can argue that point, I'm sure, that, you know, what's the alternative? But there are always ways to step back and stop using products that we feel do not deserve our trust. And I'm sure each and every one of you have a memory of something that did not deserve your trust online and you stopped using it, right? It's really easy to quit. So from my perspective, the challenge that we all have is making sure our members come first, and that's something that we have as a strong priority of LinkedIn, meaning that everything which relates to privacy becomes super important. So you have to know, and I'm sure you all are aware of that, that whatever you share on social media, it's your decision to share. So you don't be surprised if everyone knows about your holiday in Tel Aviv if you decided to make it public on Twitter, right? And you decided that Instagram pictures are going to be for everyone. It's really your responsibility, and everyone, as you know, is becoming increasingly aware of the way to, re to manage one's privacy. It's really our responsibility to make sure we know what to share and what not to share. And then it's a company like us responsibility to respect the members and make them a priority in make to make sure they're going to keep the trust. No, I mean, to me, the, the, the question that really interests me is, uh, is the one that you started to raise, uh, Jeff, which is, in the end, it is about people almost owning their data. You know, more and more we, we have, so we have the responsibility of owning what we share and the responsibility of the consequences. But uh, there is probably going to grow in the years to come businesses that are going to empower people, enable people to control and potentially even commercialize their own data. And, uh, and that's going to be interesting because uh, the more it becomes sophisticated, the more you know, technology will enable not the big brother scenario of your book or, you know, to happen, but, uh, but to the country, to uh, make it happen in a way that serves the users and serves the you know, problems of the world. So you can actually make it part of the solution as opposed to seeing it as a problem. Uh, companies have to deal with the privacy issues. I, I don't agree. You, you can't control what you spread. Um, and companies have to deal with these privacy issues or they won't carry on doing good business, I think. But there's another, another issue to what you say around Google. On a, another uh, social network that I won't tell the name, but many analysts uh, pointed this, this fact, there's too much pressure on consumers and on people that are on this social network to validate the business model of the social network. So we are asking too much to the people who are connected to the social network to, for the social network to, to validate its business model. So that's one of the reasons why the, the reach uh, decreases on this social network for some, for some people, for some analysts. And, uh, and of course you also have the generational issues about privacy because there are certain generations of people whose ideas of privacy are different than your own. But the rules and regulations for privacy are written by their grandparents. And eventually, some of this may catch up in terms of what's a, what, you, what you're willing to share, or what you're willing to share when you're 17 versus what you're willing to share when you're 35. And that um, all these things are still in flux in terms of how this evolves. And I, I, I do believe that this part of the future is de definitely unwritten. But you have to have trust. I think the one thing that's fundamental to, inside of social is this understanding of trust between you and the platforms you're using, that, the, that your private messages remain private that your uh, messages uh, about certain things are your messages and there's authenticity too, right? It's your voice. Because you know, we've seen people you know, hack into different systems, you've been spammed sometimes, maybe if 
any of your accounts have been hacked, you've seen that all of a sudden certain, you've sent an email to a friend saying that you're stranded in, in a certain city and need money wired to you. But you haven't seen 100 tweets go out or 50 tweets randomly over the course of the month that weren't your own. You haven't seen certain things hijacked where all of a sudden you became a psychopath, that you all of a sudden get banned from where you're going because you went crazy. But maybe it wasn't you. But we, we, luckily we haven't seen those things. But there's an implicit authenticity and voice that goes with trust that goes with the privacy of the information behind it. And I think that that's something which is really paramount to a lot of these other things just working. Because without trust, it's very hard to have relationships. It's, with, it's very hard to, 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 to coexist. Um, all right, um, I know we, one of us is a little bit in a rush. Um, any other questions from the audience? Ah, uh, Tao, uh, here's a microphone. This way it could be caught on camera. Um, you're all uh, experienced marketers so I wanted to bring in that the angle of s companies that are starting, startups, small companies. Um, you think you have a great product. You think people want it and need it and will pay for it. And the marketing aspect seems sometimes just like, yeah, it's technical. I, I'm just going to get in front of these people and they're going to buy my product. Obviously, it's never the case. So I'd love to hear some tips, ideas on how would you approach this stage within startups and small companies. Um, I, I can't answer directly, but uh, one of the reasons why I'm here, you know, why we, is because indeed I really believe that there is a, a huge opportunity to cross fertilize, and I'm doing my best, in fact, to uh, build a bridge between all of our brands, you know, but also all our marketers, uh, especially the best ones, with the startups, because I think it can really be mutually beneficial. Because by definition. You know, you, everything, the way you approach it, you're very nimble, very fast, you know, you, you, you don't do a lot of research, but you certainly get immediate feedback, uh, etc. And so it's a great way for us to see, you know, what's coming next, where the future is, is going in terms of uh, new technologies, new ideas that are especially here very much into the space of social media, of ad tech, etc. It's a great way for us to be much more in contact with where the future is going to come from, and it's a great way potentially to have conversations, you know, with you about uh, that can maybe give you a hint of how to approach marketing-wise, you know, some of your challenges. So uh, watch this space because one of the things we really are trying to do is do a kind of a peering or um, mentoring, you know, working much more to bridge the gap between the startup world and uh, and the big brands world, at least for what we're concerned. I, I would say Pierre Mathieu, French philosopher, said uh, you need to be two to be intelligent. So you cannot work alone and have ideas alone, or you're, you stay on your own. What do we try to do is open our research throughout uh, what we, we could call open innovation. And we've just launched a lab in Los Angeles with Orange. We have four people there, and we try to make research build new products with the clients so that we can share experience. We will do the same in Israel and we will do the same in Korea. Share with our um, clients uh, our proper product and the way it's been built and uh, imagined. Uh, question uh, before we close the panel. In the back, stand up and shout it out. Social spam. Do we, have, do we have an answer? Do we have an opinion? We're not sure about the question. Oh, we're not sure about the question. Could you answer, ask the question in 140 characters or less, please? <laughs> I think the reality, you don't need to manage it 
it will manage itself. It's like, you know, the question, you can answer it by yourself. How do you manage your social conversation if you go for a dinner? You know, if you're trying to be the center of the conversation on every topic and on everything, you're the one who has the answer and who says something and tries to have the monopoly of the conversation. This is social spam. It's, it's dinner spam, you know? And, uh, and so the reality immediately, you know, you're going to see people are going to start to, you know, uh, uh, try to have private conversations so they avoid you. I think, you know, it will manage itself. That's the beauty of, of communities, is that to manage a community, you need to have one. And if you are boring and to hell and you lose the trust of the community, then, then it will manage your, you out. Um, thank you. Maybe just a closing comments to end the panel. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, you're going to think I'm in awe of Dove and Unilever by making this comment again, but I think what's interesting is that we get advice, as marketeers, we're getting advice from one of the uh, most visible brands, Unilever, and one of the most uh, senior marketeers around. And I really like that comment about it's only dinner, right? It's just dinner conversation. I really like the, 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 the comment that it's, it's um, more casual, it's more personal, and it's more emotional. And the other thing, as a takeaway, I'd like to share with you as marketeers, whether you're working for a startup or a large organization, is from our conversations today, uh, one of the things that um, I think is, a, is something to look for is A, someone to manage your data, understand the data, look for data. And they, another word for data is insights. So it's global intelligence. Is you remember from minority reports, the only thing that was a mistake from Minority Report was that it's supposed to take place 2017. It's taking right? place now. It's taking place now. So the intelligence overall comes from understanding of what data to look for and understanding the right insights from the data, which is uh, the Dove example and many other examples. And the other, so looking for a data scientist, maybe for a data scientist will be my advice for all marketeers and, and having all marketeers trained to understand data and insights. And the second thing is understand the power of storytelling. I think it's a really exciting time to be a marketeer because we used to sell, we used to create advertising, we used to create um, films that we hope people will remember. Now we're creating stories that people will engage with and they will embrace, comment and share on social media. To me it looks like Storytelling is now really getting to a real age of storytelling and not just advertising. So I close by uh, bringing two, uh, two thoughts together. One, you know, if uh, you assume that the Moore's Law uh, applies to social media and to sharing, you know, over the next 10 years, Mark Zuckerberg says that you, we will be sharing a thousand times more, you know, in 10 years. Fact one. Fact two, for those of you who have seen a movie called Into the Wild, uh, one of the quotes at the end, it's a guy who lives, you know, to go into the wild to actually find happiness. The last quote at the end of the movie says, you know, happiness is only real if it can be shared. So maybe in, a thousand, maybe in ten years we'll be a thousand times more happy. I would just like you, whatever the, the social network is, to share uh, with me the best place to hang around tonight. And as the Beatles once said, and as the Beatles once said, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Guys, thanks a lot. Thanks for being here today. <laughs> <laughs>